All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The United States District Court for the Eastern District of Wisconsin is now open. The Honorable Judge Pamela Pepper presiding. All persons having business before this Honorable Court are admonished to draw near and to give their attention for the Court is now in session. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Have a seat, everyone, please. Court calls the civil case 2019 CB 484 Andrew Colburn versus Netflix Inc. et al. Please state your appearances starting with the attorneys for the plaintiff. George Burnett, April Barker, and Michael Griesbach on behalf of the plaintiff. Thank you. For the defendant? James Friedman of Godfrey and Kahn and Lita Walker and Lee Levine of Ballard Spar for the defendants. The attorneys by phone? Good morning, Ronald. This is Matthew Kelly for the defendant. Anybody else on the phone, Ms. Rule? Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you all. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're here this morning, as you know, because we have several motions uh, on file, most particularly uh, motions to dismiss um, from uh, the defendants. Um, I've reviewed all the pleadings and the small <clears throat> rainforest of trees worth of paper that you all have murdered uh, in in briefing them and in filing attachments, I think I have a little bit of a grip on what you're arguing and what you're concerned about. Um, I am more than happy to give you all additional opportunity to make argument, but I should note, and I think perhaps Ms. Robles already told you, I have a 9.30 criminal matter, I mean a 10.30, sorry, criminal matter um, that I have to take up. So. Uh, that's the amount of time that we've got this morning. Um, so with that, uh, let me just walk through uh, what I understand that we've got in front of us. We have Netflix motion to dismiss. That's at docket number 30. We have the plaintiff's uh, motion to file for leave to file a second amended complaint. That's at docket number 84. We have a motion from Chrome. Wixardi and Demos to dismiss for improper service. That's docket number 35. And then we have two requests uh, from the plaintiff to file sir replies or request to file two different uh, sir replies. Um, and then finally, we have a motion by the plaintiff to extend the time to serve in the event that I conclude that service was improper. Any other pending matters that anybody can think of that I didn't list off? No? Okay. So I think we should probably start with, um, assuming that you all want to make argument, and I'll ask you on each of these, but we should probably start with Netflix's motion uh, to dismiss. Does the defendant wish to make any further argument in that regard? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Would you prefer that I you know, normally I prefer that you sit because that puts you closer to the microphone, but it looks like somebody scrooched the Elmo in just such a position that I'll be listening to the Elmo talk to me Happy if you to sit. <laughs> Happy to stand. Yeah, just make sure that the mic is canted up. Um, okay. Gotcha. Oh, that's good. I won't be long, Your Honor, although I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you have. Uh, I'm pleased to report that, unlike the motion that you're going to hear next, um, this one boils down to a single, relatively straightforward issue. And that's whether the plaintiff, uh, who is a conceded public official, has plausibly alleged, either in his initial or his proposed second amended complaint, sufficient facts to plausibly allege that Netflix, as opposed to the individual defendants, disseminated making a murderer with the required actual malice which means that they did so despite a high degree of awareness that its references to Officer Colburn were probably false. I'm not going to belabor the contours of the plausibility standards set out in Iqbal and Twombly because I know the court's familiar with them, but I'll pause to emphasize that in this circuit, as in every other to consider the question, there is no doubt that the plausibility requirement applies to the actual malice issue. Seventh Circuit case on point is Pippin versus NBC Universal, which we cite in our brief. With that backdrop, I'll focus on why neither the initial complaints nor their proposed successor 
plausibly pleads actual malice with respect to Netflix. And that's largely because the affirmative allegations contained in those pleadings foreclose any plausible claim to that effect against Netflix. There are at least six reasons for this. First, the second amended complaint affirmatively pleads that it was the individual defendants, not anyone employed by Netflix, who attended every day of Stephen Avery's trial and reviewed all of the voluminous court filings in that and other litigation involving him. And that it was therefore only caught plausibly could have been those defendants who allegedly made editing decisions that they knew falsified the trial testimony and other proceedings they described precisely because they, and not anyone employed by Netflix, had either attended or reviewed the record of all of those proceedings. Second, the second amended complaint affirmatively pleads that the individual defendants who allegedly did all of these things were employed by an independent production company, Defendant Crow Media, not by Netflix. Third, the only specific action taken by Netflix that is pled on the basis of something other than information and belief is that Netflix distributed Making a Murderer to a worldwide audience. Fourth, the second amended complaint itself affirmatively pleads that the program communicates to a reasonable viewer, which presumably includes Netflix, that it is an objective and accurate account of the proceedings it described, and that, to quote the opposition brief to this motion at page three, quote, nothing in the broadcast indicate to viewers that there have been edits, close quote. Fifth, there's no allegation in the second amended complaint that Netflix considered or even had any reason to consider that the individual defendants were either unreliable or untrustworthy. Indeed, the complaint affirmatively pleads precisely the opposite, pleading that at all relevant times, the individual defendants, and I quote from paragraph 16, have avowed that they were unbiased and objective in their retelling of events, close quote. And finally, the second amended complaint implicitly acknowledges that Netflix was aware of the following undisputed facts from the face of the program itself that Stephen Avery had been wrongfully convicted and imprisoned for almost 20 years for a crime that he did not commit, that while Avery was incarcerated, plaintiff, who was then a corrections official in Manitowoc County, received a call from another law enforcement agency informing him that someone else had confessed to the crime of which a Manitowoc County inmate, who turned out to be Stephen Avery, had been convicted, and that despite that information, the plaintiff did not prepare a contemporaneous written report of the call, no apparent effort was made to investigate the matter further, and as a result, Avery remained in prison for several more years. And Netflix was also aware, again, from the face of the program itself, of the undisputed facts that following Avery's ultimate release, he filed a civil lawsuit against Manitowoc County, that shortly thereafter, he was arrested for a murder that he says he didn't commit, and that despite publicly announced efforts to transfer responsibility for that matter elsewhere, given the obvious conflict of interest, the plaintiff nevertheless participated in a search for the decedent's car and a second search of Avery's home during which magically he discovered the key to the decedent's vehicle, which became crucial evidence against Avery. Your Honor, given all of these undisputed pleaded allegations, it is manifestly implausible to make the conclusory assertion, as the amended complaint does, that Netflix disseminated making a murderer despite a high degree of awareness that its references to this plaintiff were probably false. Your Honor, the law on this is straightforward. A distributor such as Netflix cannot be said to have disseminated a work of nonfiction created by someone else with actual malice, be it a book, a magazine article, a film, or a television series with actual malice unless the work itself relates information that is on its face inherently improbable, or there were obvious, or as the Seventh Circuit has put it, blatant reasons to doubt the reliability of the creator or author. We've cited a host of cases arising in the context of a variety of media that articulate and apply this well-accepted rule, including especially the Sands versus Playboy Enterprises case from the Seventh Circuit and the Biskupic versus Cicero case from the Wisconsin Court of Appeals. Your Honor, these cases and the liability standard they apply demonstrate that this plaintiff cannot state a plausible claim against Netflix as a matter of law. I might also suggest that although they will undoubtedly deny it, the plaintiff's counsel in their heart of hearts know this is true, which explains why in their opposition brief, they rely primarily on the contention that New York Times versus Sullivan 
should be overruled and the actual malice standard it established abandoned, a contention they concede this court is powerless to accept. For these reasons, Your Honor, I respectfully submit that Netflix's motion to dismiss should be granted, that the plaintiff's motion for leave to file the second amended complaint should be denied as futile, and that the case against Netflix should be dismissed with prejudice. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions. And my first one is I'm a bit at a loss with regard to Netflix's argument that it was the individual defendants who actually sat through and listened to the trial and that somehow or another, because they're the ones who were physically present in the courtroom, that they're the only ones who could have kind of gotten the general flavor of what was going on in that courtroom. There was obviously a set of transcripts, a full set of transcripts, the plaintiff argues, a full unedited set of transcripts. And while that might not necessarily show one's facial features or expressions or tone of voice, one doesn't have to sit in the courtroom to read a set of transcripts and understand all the words that were said. And some of the allegations here are that Netflix, in the second amended complaint, that Netflix was involved in editing those transcripts. And some of the allegations are that it's those edits that produced a misleading result. So I'm curious about the significance of whose butt was in a chair, forgive my saying, in the courtroom. Your Honor, the physical presence in the courtroom is, for the reasons you've stated, not dispositive or even particularly relevant, except in the sense that the second amended complaint includes as exhibits documents that demonstrate, and it is otherwise undisputed, that these filmmakers, the individual defendants, worked on this project for seven years before they took it to Netflix, that they literally camped out in Manitowoc County. They're the ones who pawed through all the trial transcripts. They're the ones who attended trial proceedings. They're the ones who read all the record materials. And by the time that they came to Netflix, they had multiple episodes already in rough cut. They had others already scripted. They had a full storyboard. And that in the context of a claim that a distributor like Netflix, whose job it is to distribute works to the public, would have rolled up its sleeves and reviewed transcripts and checked to see if the editing that the plaintiffs, that the other defendants did, accurately reflected what took place at the trial is itself implausible. And it's all obviously played on information and belief. And the court is entitled to look with some jaundiced eye at an accusation like that or an allegation like that to test whether that is a reasonable inference to draw from the mere fact, the only fact that's alleged in the complaint, not on information and belief, that Netflix distributed the work. It's like saying the owner of a bookstore can be plausibly be said to act with actual malice if a plaintiff puts in a complaint on information and belief. The bookstore owner reviewed the book and reviewed all of the allegations in the book against the source material before it put the book on the shelves. We know that that's manifestly implausible, as is this. Another question that I have is, I think I heard your argument correctly, but I may not have. You said that one of the arguments in support of dismissal is that the film was distributed or was released with claims that it was factually accurate and that there was nothing to indicate that there were any edits. How does that support dismissal against allegations that there were, in fact, edits and that Netflix had some part in making those edits? Because the allegation that Netflix had a part in making those edits, as I've just stated, is itself implausible. And that leaves you with the position that when this stuff, when the episodes that were already in the can, when the scripts for the other episodes, when they were presented to Netflix, that Netflix somehow developed obvious reasons to doubt the accuracy of the 
the material it was presented with on the grounds that it was inherently improbable, which is the legal standard under the actual malice test for, dis for distribution of material created by somebody else, and that the uh, amended complaint itself affirmatively says anybody looking at this program would think it was an objective and fair account of what happened, excuse me, uh, in, in the underlying legal proceedings. So nothing jump, would have jumped out to Netflix that said, hmm, this is inherently improbable, or uh, we have reason, obvious reason to doubt that this is accurate. And that, that's, that's the reason why uh, that's important. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, for the plaintiff, Mr. Conway? Yes, Your Honor. Um, George Burnett for the plaintiff. The, I think if we get to the nub of this, the defendant's position is, is that it would be implausible to believe that they did anything more than take a final product from two novice film producers who they'd never worked with before, looked at it, said, this looks good to us, especially because these novice, novice film producers told them we're unbiased, and then disseminated it worldwide. The defendant's position is, is that if you believe anything except for that, it's silly. Uh, the, if I had to summarize what I hear the defendant saying, it is two things. Number one, you really didn't tell us in anything except for legalese what we did wrong. And Number two, you didn't distinguish between what we did wrong and what our co-defendants did wrong. And therefore, the courthouse door is closed to you. That's not the law. Uh, I found it interesting that there's a debate going on in the briefs about um, and a case out of the Seventh Circuit uh, Doe versus Smith. Doe versus Smith is a Judge Easterbrook decision that came before Iqbal and Twombly, and it really, in a very articulate fashion, describes what a pleading responsibility is. You need not plead facts, you need not plead law, you need not plead legal theories, you just need to give the defendant a narrative informing them what they did wrong. Now the defense says that that's obsolete, that that is no longer the law. Uh, we say it, it, it remains the law. Um, after reading the reply brief, I, I looked up, I shepherdized Doe versus Smith, and I found that Judge Edelman has cited and quoted that decision a half a dozen times. Judge Griesbach has cited and quoted that decision two or three times. Um, that decision is a clear articulation of what the plaintiff must prove here. Um, this particular complaint alleges that the defendants collaborated. They put together a, what they called a documentary that was misleading and deceptive and destroyed or came close to destroying Mr. Colburn's life. The courts read the allegations of damages and I need not repeat them here. Um, it is true that anything the defendants did individually doesn't carry the day. Um, for example, uh, Netflix um, e editing a transcript alone doesn't carry the day. But the combination of factors that went on here does carry the day. They utilized only biased witnesses, Mr. Avery, his relatives, his lawyers. They edited transcripts 
in a misleading and deceptive fashion to communicate information that was never imparted by Mr. Colburn and other witnesses. Um, they were not under any hot deadline. There, this was not hot news as the cases um, uh, call it. They had the luxury of time, the opportunity to investigate and inspect. Um, indeed, the facts seem to be that when this particular publication came to Netflix, they had three rough cuts and it ended up being 10 episodes or so. Um, there are uh, a half a dozen other things that make this uh, suspects, make actual malice plausible. Uh, the defendant's main contention is, is that we didn't distinguish between what they did and what their co-defendants did. Well, and allegations that they collaborated, that they created, that they edited, that they worked together are adequate. We don't have to distinguish at this stage of the litigation what Netflix did right and what Netflix did wrong. And it is no defense to say that you've relied on the work or the reports of others to an action for defamation against a public official. Uh, there, there is a greater obligation, especially when you're faced with circumstances that should tell you perhaps this information isn't true. After all, both of the defendants were convicted, Mr. Dassey, Mr. Avery in separate trials, and those convictions were affirmed on appeal. There was plenty of warning signs for Netflix to take heed of. And discovery will tell us just how much heed they took. So unless the court has any questions, I think that just about summarizes the plaintiff's position. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. Uh, as an aside, I called you Mr. Conway. <laughs> I was going to apologize to you for that, but given the great respect I have for your former partner um, and the fact that I miss him, maybe let's just chalk that up to wishful thinking that I could see Mr. Conway here. I know who you are. <laughs> we, we all miss him, Your Honor. Yeah, I know. Any, any rebuttal comments? Yes, yes Your Honor, I want to make a, just a, a few brief comments. First, um, the Doe v. Smith case to which Mr. Burnett refers is clearly no longer good law. It relies on the no set of facts standard set out by the Supreme Court in Conley v. Gibson, which was expressly repudiated in Iqbal and Twombly. Uh, if, if the court would like a current version of Judge Easterbrook's views with respect to what Iqbal and Twombly means, I commend to you the Bank of America case, uh, which is cited in our briefs, which is remarkably similar to this one because in, in response to something else that Mr. Burnett said, that is another case where the plaintiff in its pleading referred generically to defendants did this, defendants did that, defendants did the other thing. And just, Judge Easterbrook expressly held that in the Iqbal Twombly world, that just doesn't cut it. You have to say what each defendant did and plausibly allege what, ha what that defendant did that would lead to liability. Um, and Your Honor, in one of your own decisions, I think you put it quite well in the Anderson case, which we also cite in our complaint, you say that Iqbal and Twombly requires a plaintiff to set out who, what, where, when, and why. And the who is, who did what is important. A general allegation that defendants did this and defendants did that just doesn't cut it. And in this case, it's even clearer because the complaint alleges on many, many specific occasions, and we cite the specific paragraphs in our papers, that the individual defendants did this, the individual defendants did that, the individual defendants did that, and then there's just a conclusory assertion that defendants collaborated, that all defendants collaborated in doing these things. That is simply not sufficient under Iqbal and Twombly. Two more quick points. One is, it is demonstrably incorrect from the face of the program, which Your Honor is entitled to look at it on a motion to dismiss because it is incorporated in the pleading by reference, 
that it does not rely only on biased witnesses uh, favoring Mr. Avery. It has detailed uh, interviews and statements and press conferences held by the prosecutors uh, and trial proceedings involving the prosecutors in telling the, the state's side of the story. Uh, and it reports quite explicitly that uh, Mr. Dacey and, and uh, Mr. Avery were found guilty. That wasn't kept secret from the audience. That's a, a centerpiece of the thing. And finally, in response to your honor's uh, previous questions to me, further response to your honor's previous questions to me about the plausibility of the contention, the generalized on information and belief contention that um, Netflix somehow uh, participated in the editing the law is clear, both in the Iqbal case itself uh, and in a host of seven, seven Circuit places, including the McCauley case, which we cite in our brief, that where, as in this case, there is an obvious alternative explanation for the conduct that's alleged in the complaint, you haven't pushed the, the claim across the line from possibility to plausibility. And here, where it is clear and specifically pled in the complaint, that Netflix was a distributor. And it's common knowledge and common sense that that's what Netflix does. It is a distributor of programming. That obvious alternative explanation to the implausible notion that they sat there and reviewed trial transcripts and checked it against the, the, parts of the form that the producers, that the individual defendants gave them, somehow um, is a plausible contention in the face of the obvious alternative explanation. It, it just can't carry the day. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Um, you all are, are fully aware of the 12B6 standard, and Mr. Levine and Mr. Bonet have both uh, discussed it, um, and I think everyone is in agreement that the plausibility standard that Judge Easterbrook has talked about uh, and, and has been discussed over and over and over again in Seventh Circuit cases uh, is, is the appropriate one. Um, and just as an aside and just for the purposes of the record, um, again, we're talking right now in particular about the defamation claim in which the plaintiff has to show a false statement communicated by speech, conduct, or writing. Uh, it's not privileged, and it tends to harm him's reputation so as to lower him in the estimation of the community or deter third persons from associating or dealing with them. And that's in Ray Storms versus Action Wisconsin, Inc. Um, 309 West 2nd, 704 at 722. Um, a Wisconsin case from 2008, and then we know, of course, that if the person who is allegedly defamed is a public official, then we have the, ne the next step, which is um, that actual malice step, step, and the one I think that for for the great part, um, Netflix has um, focused on. Um, I it seems to me uh, that the plaintiff has conceded that the plaintiff meets the definition of a public official. Um, but what the plaintiff has argued is that particularly the second amended complaint alleges sufficient facts to demonstrate uh, that Netflix acted with actual malice. And of course, um, actual malice under Wisconsin law occurs when the actor either knows that a statement is false or makes the statement with reckless disregard for its truth or falsity. And that's Erdman versus FS Broad, SF, sorry, Broad, 229 West 2nd, 156 at 169, the Court of Appeals case from 1999. And, and particular in that reckless disregard neighborhood, uh, the plaintiff has to show that the defendant, in fact, entertained serious doubts as to the publication, or in this case, the production's truth. Um, that's again from Erdman at pages 169 through 70. Um, and of particular note, um, a defendant cannot necessarily escape liability simply by claiming that the defendant believed that the production was truthful. Um, that's the St. Ament case, uh, 390 U.S. at 732. Um, recklessness can be found when there are obvious reasons 
to doubt the veracity of the information or the accuracy uh, of, it, of it. Again, from um, St. Armand. Um, Mr. Levine pointed out that uh, the plaintiffs have made an argument that that actual malice standard in New York Times versus Sullivan, the Supreme Court should rethink. I'm not going to spend any time on that. I, I'm not the boss of them, <laughs> obviously, and that's going to have to be an argument that perhaps the plaintiff will have an opportunity to raise in front of that august body at some point in time, but um, I'm not the... I'm not the person to do that. So when I turn to the amended complaint, um, I, I, I think that the that Netflix's argument about lumping, if you will, which is lots of people did this, lots of people did that, lots of people did the other things, uh, accurately characterizes the amended complaint. Um, however, the plaintiffs have the plaintiff has filed. Uh, a second amended complaint, or a proposed amended complaint, and is part of this uh, pr proceedings asking for leave to file that proposed amended complaint. And again, if we're simply talking the threshold issue that we talk about at a 12B6 stage, which is looking within the four corners of that second amended complaint, determining whether or not there have been enough facts alleged, whether on information and belief or otherwise, to put the defendant on notice as to what the defendant is alleged to have done. I think the Second Amendment complaint is substantively different than the first in a number of ways. There are specific allegations as to Netflix, not just everybody held hands and worked together, but as to Netflix, there are specific allegations in the Second Amendment complaint. Um, for example, um, the fact that Netflix accepted awards for making a murder, um, for writing and editing. Netflix accepted those awards. That its employees were recognized in the media for their role in sort of defining this, this new genre. I'm not sure that it's hugely new, but genre of television. There were Netflix employers, according to the Second Amendment complaint, who produced several of the individual episodes of the program. They were, um, there were Netflix employees who've made statements to the press regarding their roles in uh, producing the programs. Uh, there is, of course, reference to collaboration with Demos and Ricciardi, and those, those were uh, allegations that existed in the amended uh, complaint. Um, but, but there were employees who discussed their own roles, and those were employees of Netflix. The, plaintiffs have the plaintiff has alleged in the second amended complaint that in point of fact, there were only, I think, three episodes, rough cut episodes, that were, as Mr. Levine put it in industry speak, in the can um, at the time that they came in and pitched to Netflix. And as it turns out, there were a total of 10 episodes that were uh, produced, um, and they weren't rough, they were final episodes. Um, and the allegation is that, the, that Netflix had a role in developing the programs, in vetting them, um, all the way from pre-production through post-production, um, and uh, that, that Netflix had a role in the final um, content decisions. Um, they also, the second amended complaint also alleges that in October of last year, the second part, uh, Making a Murder Part 2, uh, was admitted and was submitted, uh, sorry, released. And by that time, Netflix had reason to be aware of criticism that had arisen over Part 1 and the accuracy or lack of accuracy, depending on who's doing the talking, of part one, and yet continued to proceed with part two. Um, and again, the allegations in the second amendment complaint are that Netflix specifically was heavily involved in the production, the post-production, and the editing of that second um, series as well as, of course, marketing and distributing, which Netflix has conceded uh, that it was the distributor. 
um, they quote the the uh, amended complaint quotes Richardi and Demos as indicating that Netflix was a partner uh, in the making of uh, the second series and from the very beginning all the way uh, to the end. Um, and so there are in the second amended complaint specific factual allegations made as to Netflix rather than simply group allegations of the defendants doing this. There are still in the second amendment complaint some allegations that are collaborative, if you will, um, but there are a number of allegations in the second amendment complaint that are specific to Netflix. Now, Netflix has also argued that, okay, so you know, even if Netflix was a producer, had a role, or some of its employees had a role as producers or executive producers, so what? Um, you don't necessarily control a production simply because you're acting as the producer or the executive producer. Uh, I think in exactly uh, quoting from Netflix's brief, that is because there is no connection between a person's mere status as an executive producer and involvement in the editing of a film. I have no earthly idea whether that was true. I was a theater major in college, but I never made it to film. I just stood out there on the stage and flubbed my lines. So I don't know whether that's true or not. It may very well be, and that may very well be an issue for summary judgment in terms of what role anyone who carried a producer or an executive producer title may have played and what they may have done uh, as part of that role. But we're at the 12B6 stage, and the 12B6 stage says that that the plaintiff needs to plausibly state a claim. And I think the Second Amendment complaint does plausibly state a claim, and it plausibly states a claim uh, against Netflix. Um, again, there are allegations that there were uh, uh, transcripts that were sliced and diced, uh, and that Netflix uh, played a role in that. Um, with regard to Netflix's argument, um, and Mr. Levine referred to it today, uh, that that um, even if I allow the plaintiff to amend the, and to file the second amended complaint, it would be futile under Rule 15 uh, for me to allow that because it, it points to a whole series of cases where courts have declined to hold distributors liable uh, for defamatory content. Um, and, and there are numerous cases uh, that it has pointed to both at the circuit court level and at the district court level. Um, and I agree that, that, that those cases refuse to hold distributors liable. Um, however, all of those cases were very fact-bound and fact-intensive. It depended on what the distributors knew. It depended on what other role the distributor may have played, whether there was another role other than distribution. And many of those cases, by the way, refuse to hold the distributor liable at the summary judgment stage, not at the motion to dismiss stage, after they had heard evidence about what role the distributor plays. I think many of the arguments that Netflix makes with regard to the second amended complaint sound in summary judgment. They sound in, you know, wait, wait, judge, you're going to see evidence and you're going to hear that this couldn't have happened or that couldn't have happened or this is not the way it went down. Maybe that will end up being true. I don't know, but that's not where we are right now. Right now we're at the motion to dismiss stage. So uh, I am going to grant the plaintiff's motion to file a second amended complaint and deny the motion to dismiss, Netflix's uh, motion to dismiss uh, the defamation claim. I note that Netflix also spends a little bit of time talking about the other claims in the second amended complaint, the negligence claim and the intentional infliction of emotional uh, distress claim. The defendant argues that, um, uh, net, that um, the plaintiff hasn't argued uh, what, what the ordinary care was that Netflix didn't show, uh, again, hammering on the fact that it argues it didn't do anything other than distribute. Um, and so what, what standard of care could it have violated? I note that the plaintiff has alleged the, the uh, negligence claim in the alternative uh, to the defamation claim, but, but be that as it may, uh, it did uh, allege the uh, second amended complaint um, that the defendant had a duty to exercise reasonable care when communicating information about him and uh, that 
some of the statements or information that was communicated about him either was false or had been manipulated to such an extent that it misled viewers into getting a false impression and that that was a breach of that duty of care. And again, at the 12B6 stage, I think that is sufficient to state a claim and to state the elements of uh, a negligence claim under Wisconsin law. And then the last claim, of course, intentional infliction uh, of emotional uh, uh, distress. Netflix argues that this is just another way of stating the defamation claim. And, and they also state that, that um, the plaintiff can't prove the claim um, because they can't, the plaintiff can't prove that Netflix intended to cause uh, emotional distress. Um, the plaintiff has alleged otherwise, again, at the pleading stage, the plaintiff has stated a claim. And so for all of those reasons, I'm going to deny Netflix's motion to dismiss and allow the plaintiff to file a second amended complaint. Um, th where that takes us to next is uh, the um, motions by Crone, um, Danielson, and Ricciardi um, in their motion to dismiss um, with regard to service. And there are some uh, related motions to that. Um, two motions to file a sur reply um, and then uh, the motion for an extension of time. I just want to address those really quickly because I don't think there's a particular need to spend a whole lot of time on them. Um, as, as you all are aware, our local rules anticipate a motion or reply, a response and a reply. They do not anticipate uh, a sir reply, which is why uh, the plaintiff has sought leave to file sir replies. And generally, um, I, I would hazard a guess that my colleagues and I are all in the same boat, which is that we're not huge fans of sir replies. Um, there's a reason that we get a three-part uh, 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 movement gets two kicks at the cat and the respondent gets one. However, if there are circumstances in which a party is attempting to respond to a motion that, uh, or an issue that was really raised for the first time in a reply, we have allowed sir replies under those circumstances. The plaintiff has filed two requests to file a sir reply. The first one's at docket number 90, and as far as I can tell, um, um, unless I'm missing something, uh, it's it's just uh, addressing a case which I was aware of before the motion for sir reply was filed that federal law applies to service after removal, state law applies to service before removal. I, I don't see any need for that sir reply, as I indicated, I already knew about the case. So I'm going to deny the motion to file for leave to file the sir reply at docket number 90. I don't think it advances the ball. However, the second motion that the plaintiff filed it falls into that category that I described of seeking to address an issue that came up only on reply. Um, the, the plaintiff is asked to file a sir reply addressing the second declaration of defendant Damos, which was filed with the defendant's reply brief. Um, and, and the plaintiff says that it has located, or he has located records from the California Secretary of State that are inconsistent with Damos's second declaration. Um, I don't hear Netflix or the defendants, uh, sorry, uh, plural, um, objecting to my considering the records. They just say they're not inconsistent. They don't change anything. They don't make a difference. Um, but I think that that is an appropriate use of a sir reply. And so I am going to grant the second motion um, for leave to file a sir reply. And I'll consider both the information in that second motion and the defendant's arguments in opposition to that information. Um, as part of determining the motion to dismiss. Um, that then brings me to the motion to dismiss itself and to service. And let me just say, and I'll give each of you an opportunity to address what I'm about to say, but I regretfully believe, for all of our sakes, that I'm not in a position to resolve the motion to dismiss with regard to effective service without an evidentiary hearing. There is a lot of dis disagreement between the parties over who got what, who knew what, who did what, when. Uh, we've got flat statements in some cases by people that they never received service in contrast to other people who said yes they did. Um, 
I, I've gone through all of this, um, and I'm happy to hear from you all, but I, I think there are a number of factual disagreements here that require fleshing out at an evidentiary hearing. The reason I say regretfully is because I understand that that is time, effort, and expense on all of your part um, to bring witnesses in on this issue. Um, but I think there are too many inconsistencies between different versions of the events for me to make that determination without hearing from some folks. Um, the other thing I will note is that the other motion I've not addressed is the motion for an extension of time to file the summons and complaint, assuming that I conclude that it's that it's not that it wasn't properly filed. Um, I think that's obviously something to address once I've made a decision about whether or not service was was effectuated. Uh, however, there's also that statute of limitations problem there. Um, it, if it if there wasn't proper service, I don't think I can extend the time. The statute of limitations is run, uh, and if there was proper service, then I can. So I think those two things are inextricably intertwined to some extent. Whether or not I can give an extension of time to serve is going to necessarily depend on whether or not um, uh, there was proper service. So uh, I'm happy to hear from anybody who wants to put an oar in the water on that, but I, after going over and over and over the facts, it I have questions that I'm not sure everybody can argue till they're blue in the face, but I'm not sure they argue, they they respond to the factual question. So from the defendants, given that it's you all's motion. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I mean, to start, we, we agree with you that the statute of limitations causes, you know, is fatal to any, any motion to extend the time. Um, and it, it sounds like you've made up your mind on the need for an evidentiary hearing. I, I did want to just clarify, because I know the record is voluminous and, and there's a lot of dates flying back and forth, that our view is there's, there's really only four affidavits of service or uh, affidavits of what they call due diligence that you need to be looking at. Um, it's docket number 44, 49, and, and 50. And, and that's all that the plaintiffs have put in the record that is not hearsay or is not perjured and withdrawn that really sets forth their position on, on when attempts to service were made and, and when they believe service was affected. We believe it was not. But I don't know that there's really a factual dispute over those affidavits. Um, our position would be that even if you take them at face value, that still doesn't constitute service. But, but if you feel more comfortable with an evidentiary hearing, we're obviously happy to comply. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Barker. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, first of all, in an, an effort, uh, first of all, if, if Wisconsin law has to be considered, then we, we certainly agree with the court that a, an evidentiary hearing is appropriate. And I would note that um, service, the affidavits that were submitted by the defendants are in fact pertinent and, and therefore those contradictions I think do have to be resolved for one reason, uh, for at least two reasons. One is that service under Wisconsin law can be proven through the written admission of a defendant, such as through affidavits uh, that were submitted in this case under uh, Section 801.10.4c. Um, second, uh, I would note with respect to the argument that there's hearsay in the affidavits of counsel, those statements regarding what counsel was told were obviously submitted for purpose of notice or knowledge of what counsel understood for purposes of the reasonable diligence analysis. They were not asserted for purposes of truth of the declarant statements. In fact, we are submitting to the court that we later found out that some of those declarations were false. Um, so, so we do think those are, are material. And then in a, I think just in a very brief, uh, perhaps last uh, salvo to attempt to spare everyone by uh, seeing whether federal law uh, is something the court would be amenable to applying uh, and, and then the hearing wouldn't be necessary. Uh, I would just note briefly um, the, the issue as we saw it um, is that the, the argument was something of a moving target. 28 U.S.C. 1448, which governs uh, service after removal where there's a defect in service or no service 
prior to removal was never mentioned in the initial motion to dismiss, but was, and we mentioned it in our response, which led to the reply brief and the mention of the Walker case. Um, as I'm sure the court is aware, the Walker case specifically distinguished Hannah versus Puma, holding that in, in Walker, there was no conflict between Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 3 and uh, the state statute of limitations that they serve different purposes in that case because Walker was not a removal case and 28 U.S.C. 1448 was not implicated. Um, because 28, uh, uh, 28 U.S.C. 1448 is implicated, this is a removal case, we think this is a Hanna case, Hanna versus Plumer, which provides that um, where there is a direct conflict between a validly promulgated federal rule and, a, and even state substantive law, even the statute of limitations, which essentially what was what was at issue in Plumer, it was a, a limitation on when in-hand service had to be accomplished on an executor in order for a claim to proceed against an estate. Um, the federal rule prevails, even if that means that somebody whose case would be dead in, in state court gets to proceed in federal court. Um, that's number one why we, we think this is not a Walker case or this is not governed by Walker. Secondly, the state statute of limitations that the defendants rely on um, in section 893 um, is also subject to the provision in section 893 of the Wisconsin statutes that holds where a uh, 893.15 in the same chapter that holds that where or provides that where a case on a Wisconsin claim is pending in a foreign forum defined to include federal courts sitting in uh, located in Wisconsin, federal law looks to, uh, I'm sorry, the foreign uh, court looks to local foreign law with respect to the question of commencement of action. That's 893.15 um, and um, it specifically states in a non-Wisconsin form, again, defined to include a federal court sitting in the state, the time of commencement or final disp disposition of an action is determined by the local law of the forum. Therefore, unlike Walker, this is not a case where there is, in fact, a conflict. Uh, it, uh, in the sense, there is a conflict if Wisconsin law says what the defendants say, they, uh, say it does. But if... Um, under 893.15, the federal law simply trumps uh, the state statute of limitations because Wisconsin defers to the federal rule as to commencement of action, unlike the Oklahoma statute that was at issue in the Walker case. And then I think I've used up our time. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. All right, any, any brief response from the defendant? Yeah, very briefly on Walker. I, I don't believe they've raised the 893.15 argument before. I, I may have missed it, but I believe that's a new argument, and of course it's not proper at this juncture. The Walker case is about when a suit was commenced. It looked at a statute nearly identical to the Wisconsin statute in Oklahoma that said it's commenced upon filing provided that service happens within X number of days. In Oklahoma it was 60, in, in Wisconsin it's 90. And that didn't happen, and everyone here agrees, and you can look at Docket 91, one of their briefs, everyone here agrees that this would have been dead in state court. Um, and that's the Bartles case, Your Honor. And, and that's, if it had stayed in state court, and if we, after an evidentiary hearing, show that service didn't occur in that 90-day period, we all agree here that it would have been dead in state court. That's Bartles. And Walker says it's dead in federal court, too. And yet they claim that removal somehow somehow resurrected it. And, Your Honor, that's not, that's not logical, and that's, that's just not the law. Um, the cases they cite, not a single one of them, with an exception of one from New York, which involved a state statute very similar to the federal law. But, but aside from that, not one of the cases they cite involves this scenario where the statute of limitations ran, the service period ran, and then there was removal. And we cite a lot of cases involving that very situation, and uniformly they hold removal doesn't resurrect the case. And I just want to quote you two passages from the one case they cite from the Eastern District of Michigan and then from Walker itself. And the Eastern District of Michigan case is Mills v. Kiriani, 238 F sub 28876. And the pertinent language there is it is only when an issue arises with respect to the tolling of a statute of limitations 
by the commencement of an action that a state law which requires something more than the mere filing of a complaint to commence an action will control. So what Mills is saying, the case they cite is somehow overruling Walker says, is that when you have a state statute where a suit is not commenced merely upon filing, but it's commenced upon filing provided that service happens within a certain number of days, then we're back in Walker territory. And that's when the state law uh, applies. And that's exactly what we have here. Provided that is straight from the Wisconsin statute. And then you can look at the Walker case itself, which again is on all four squares with our case. And the quote there is, we cannot give the cause of action longer life in the federal court than it would have had in the state court without adding something new to the cause of action. And we may not do that consistently with Erie Railroad Co. v. Tompkins. And so, Your Honor, we understand that you think we need an evidentiary hearing, but, but our position supported by every case cited in all the papers is that if you find that evidentiary hearing that service did not occur pre-removal or pre-March 18, uh, 2019, um, it, the case is over. Federal, federal rules can't save this. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you all. All right, so you have my rulings on everything except the motion to dismiss from, um, from Chrome and Demos and Ricciardi, uh, as well as the motion for an extension of time. Um, we need to terminate for today because we have another hearing uh, uh, that is about to begin. I will uh, reach out to you all in terms of setting up uh, time, date, so forth, get the logistics uh, for a hearing. Before I do that, though, I'll look at the arguments that both of you have made with regard to Walker and Hannah uh, and to make sure that that's where we need to be. Um, and if I think that's, if it turns out that we don't need an evidentiary hearing, I'll let you all know that as well. Anything else on behalf of the plaintiffs this morning? Okay, thank you. How about the defendants? All right, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. All right.